Hello again. It's 11.30, time to start session number two. Um, pleased to have you all back with us. Session number two is called Psychedelics, Cannabis, and the Brain. Again, we have three speakers, each will have 15 minutes to speak, followed by five minutes of questions. And just to supply some introduction and context, um, cannabis and psychedelic research is an area of interest given their potential therapeutic value. The legalization of non-medical cannabis in 2018 has had various societal and health impacts, and Alberta's new policy on psychedelic-assisted therapy for mental illness may set a precedent that moves Canadians one step closer to accepting psychedelics as medicinal substances. Some noteworthy efforts that are leading to advances in this field are, in 2011, the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, or MAPS, MAPS Canada, was founded with a commitment to advancing psychedelic medicine by supporting research, advocating for policy reforms, educating the public, and supporting equitable access. Within Alberta, the Alberta Cannabis Research and Innovation Network hosted a collaborative event in 2018, which really spurred the Alberta research, right? the Alberta research, government, and industry communities to collaborate. In 2019, Alberta Innovates launched the first medical cannabis research program called MCannabis in collaboration with Campus Alberta Neuroscience. And in 2022, Alberta Innovates hosted its first virtual symposium on medical cannabis and psychedelics to share knowledge and to look ahead into the future of the field. In 2021, University of Calgary recruited Dr. Leah Mayo as its Parker Psychedelic Research Chair conduct research on the potential use of psychedelics to improve mental health, which was a first for Canada. This session will showcase some of the ongoing research and look ahead at the future of the field. And our first presenter will be Dr. Erica Harding. Dr. Harding is a postdoctoral research in the labs of Dr. Tuan Trang and Dr. Gerald Zamboni, Zamponi at the University of Calgary. And her postdoctoral work focuses on defining mechanisms and pathways of opioid and cannabinoid analgesia. So Dr. Harding, welcome, and I turn the floor over to you. Great, thank you so much. And uh, thank you to Campus Alberta Neuroscience for the opportunity to speak to get today and to showcase our recent publication, which was actually just published in its final form online today. So this is like very fortuitous for us. So feel free to check it out online if you're interested in more about it. Um, so I think we're ready to start up the uh, PowerPoint. Beautiful, okay. Uh, so my project that I'm gonna to talk to you guys about today um, is about uh, cannabinoid modulation of voltage-gated calcium channels. And specifically, we were really interested in cannabidiol or CBD and especially in the context of chronic pain. And so when we talk about chronic pain on the next slide, um, yeah, there we go. Uh, what you can see is that uh, many chronic pain patients suffer from intractable, intractable pain. And this is a worldwide issue, uh, but it's also a very big issue within Canada. And so nearly 8 million Canadians are living with currently chronic pain, and that translates to 800,000 Albertans. And for these patients, there's a great decrease in their quality of life. And three out of 10 chronic pain patients have lived with this pain for more than a decade. And in these patients, uh, only half find prescription pain medications helpful. And this really highlights that we need, need to be doing better. We need to find uh, better medications to increase their quality of life and give them back, you know, for example, the ability to pick up their kids, to play, to cook after work, to have everything that they want um, out of their life. Um, so on the next slide, uh, what you'll see is that cannabis is actually a potential avenue for novel pain therapeutics. And so this is something that patients are turning to uh, off prescription and to some extent within Canada on prescription as well. So when we looked at a survey um, of over 27,000 participants, pain is listed as the top medical reason. So 53% of people using cannabis uh, for medical purposes are using it for pain. Uh, and then often the second and third reasons, problems sleeping, headaches and migraines are comorbid or intercorrelated uh, with pain itself. However, the type of cannabis product that is used varies widely. 
And specifically, the cannabinoid used varies widely. So some patients will tell you that uh, Delta 9 THC, uh, tetrahydrocannabinol, is what is really helping them. And then other patients will tell you that no, cannabidiol is actually what's really helping me. And this is of particular interest because cannabidiol or CBD actually isn't uh, psychoactive, which means that there's a better potential for therapeutic option um, that's going to give quality of life while maintaining the ability, for example, to drive and um, that type of thing. Um, so on the next slide, um, what is really kind of interesting about CBD, so like I said, there's not a psychoactive action. This is because it's actually functioning very different within our bodies than THC. And indeed, we actually don't really know how it could be producing analgesia. So when you look um, on the left-hand side here, you can see your standard uh, way that a cannabinoid would work. So THC will bind to endogenous cannabinoid receptors within your body, which will lead to uh, inhibition um, of synaptic transmission between neurons, uh, predominantly through voltage-gated calcium channels and other types of signaling pathways. However, CBD uh, is very strange because it actually has very little action at CB receptors uh, themselves. Um, so that's why we have that red X right there. Um, so instead, uh, on the next slide, we have a very complicated uh, diagram, and I'm not going to go into too much detail here, but basically we have many potential candidates of what cannabidiol could be doing within our bodies to produce analgesia. So it likes to bind to many different receptors with very different uh, binding capacity. Um, so potential candidates that are relevant to analgesia or pain relief would be uh, action at the TRPV1 or capsaicin receptor, action at serotonin receptors, dopamine receptors. And what's really quite interesting also is that there's potential that cannabidiol may even be antagonistic towards cannabinoid receptors. But very, way down at the bottom is something that was really relevant to us in the Zamponi lab. Uh, because the Zamponi lab really likes calcium, <laughs> and specifically we like voltage-gated calcium channels. And so there was this really nice study from Mark Connor's lab a few years back where they found that CBD can actually um, directly inhibit uh, calcium channels, and specifically one calcium channel called CAV 3.2. Um, so why this is interesting, uh, in order to understand why this is interesting, we have to look a bit more into the pain pathway itself. Um, so on the next slide, uh, we can talk about the pain transmission pathway to the brain. Uh, so when you have a noxious insult, like a trauma, um, which is going to activate nociceptors present within skin, organs, joints, and these are going to sense that noxious stimulus, and they're going to transmit that um, as an action potential up into the spinal cord and then onto the brain. Um, and so we have a little uh, animation that will hopefully play. Yeah, there we go. So that is your pain, is basically your nociceptive signal, which is coming up, going through multiple different neurons along the pathway, and then eventually reaching the brain where it becomes part of your pain experience. So this requires a synaptic transmission between multiple different neurons. And this synaptic transmission is dependent on voltage-gated calcium channels. Uh, so on the next slide, we'll show what happens when you block voltage-gated calcium channels. So when we start the uh, animation, instead, when you have voltage-gated calcium channels blocked, that pain signal gets stuck in the spinal cord and can't reach the brain. So this is sort of the theory behind how uh, inhibition of voltage-gated calcium channels could lead to pain relief. Um, so we have two main calcium channels that are highly implicated in the pain pathway. Uh, on the next slide, we can talk about which, so these are CAV 2.2 and CAV 3.2. And so they're particularly responsible at that first connection from primary afferent neurons, which are detecting uh, that, um, that, that signal in your periphery into the spinal cord. And so uh, we had two main research aims um, on the next slide. There we go, yeah. Uh, so our two main research aims. First uh, was whether CBD can have any effects on CAV 2.2 and CAV 3.2. And 
we were really broad about this question. Is this happening through the CP1 receptor or is it happening through a direct interaction? We want to know if there's anything going on at all. And then our second question, and this is a bigger and more difficult question to answer, was whether CBD produces uh, this pain relief in a manner that is dependent on CAV 3.2. So if CAV 3.2 is gone, can we still have analgesia when we put CBD on board? Um, so to ask our first question, uh, on the next slide, we have a quick methods. I'm not going to go too in detail today, but basically what to ask the question of whether CBD can have effects on these channels, we have to have a blank slate to work with. Um, so what we did is we used uh, human embryonic kidney cells in culture um, or hex cells. And you can kind of think of these as an empty bag. They're an empty slate upon which we can use pl plasmids to express uh, our channels of interest. In this case, CAV 3.2 or CAV uh, 2.2. Um, just wanted to make sure people can hear me. Apparently not everyone can hear yeah. me. All I good? Okay. Um, so, um, basically what we do is we virally express, um, CAV 3.2 or CAV 2.2 along with a green fluorescent protein. And then I look under a microscope and if a cell is fluorescing, green, then I am good to go. And I use a technology called electrophysiology, which basically uh, creates an electrical circuit. Um, and then with that electrical circuit, I can record the electrical activity of these cells. And so with a voltage gated calcium channel, we have a lot of calcium rushing in and that calcium rushing in is actually an electrical current. And um, so when we record the electrical activity, we're directly assessing the function of this channel. And on the right hand, you can see um, in black, for example, we have a normal current. So there's that nice inward current, downward current. And then for example, if we put a blocker on board in green, you can see that that current becomes smaller. And that represents a change in the function of that channel. Smaller current means less pain transmission. Um, so on the next slide, we have uh, what we saw with cannabidiol. So this is with just CAV 3.2, CAV 3.2 on board. Um, and we have a time course on the left-hand side here, starting from time zero every 20 seconds, we sampled the uh, function of this channel. And as soon as CBD went on board, you can see that, that uh, the size of the current became smaller. And about 300 seconds after we added CBD, we have this sustained smaller current. So this is giving us an indication that CBD is indeed inhibiting directly CAV 3.2. And if we have that, we have the potential for less pain transmission. Um, and then when we tried with uh, CB1 receptor on board on the next slide, um, you can see there's actually no difference. So what's happening is completely independent of the CB1 receptor. So CBD is doing what it's doing on CAV 3.2 and it doesn't really care about the, the CB1 receptor. So this is a direct inhibition of the channel. Um, conversely, when we tried with CAV 2.2 um, on the next slide, uh, we can see, um, well, it doesn't really get to be much more of a flat line than that. So in this case, when we expressed even CAV 0.2 and the CB1 receptor, there was no effect of cannabidiol or CBD. Um, so whereas CBD has this really profound inhibition of CAV 3.2, it's not doing anything to CAV 2.2. So next, we moved on to our next uh, aim, which was really our big aim, whether CBD can produce analgesia in a CAV 3.2 dependent manner. So to answer this question, we had to turn to an in vivo model. And what we did is we looked at this preclinical model of inflammatory pain, uh, which involves the injection of a compound called complete Freund's adjuvant or CFA into the hind paw of a mouse. And so with the white circles here, what you can see is over time, uh, the hind paw of this mouse actually becomes hypersensitive. And what we're measuring on the y-axis is thermal withdrawal latency to a heat source. Um, and so over time, it's lifting its paw quicker and quicker because that's representing a pain hypersensitivity uh, versus a control mouse, which you can see is again, a flat line. Now, here's the cool question. What happens when we give CBD? Um, 
So when we give CBD, um, on the next slide, we have it in green. Uh, so in this case, uh, CBD was administered right into the spinal cord or intrathecally, which lets us ask the question directly at the level of the spinal cord. And when we gave CBD, you can see there's this uh, basically reversal at 30 and 60 minutes after administration um, of that hypersensitivity. And this represents an analgesic effect, which means that indeed CBD is producing analgesia. Um, so next, the question is, what does this have to do with CAV 3.2? Um, so on the next slide, we tried two minutes, got it. Uh, on the next slide, we tried um, what happens when we knock out CAV 3.2. So we have a genetic mouse model which lacks CAV 3.2 and it's called a null mouse. And so just to give you kind of an illustration of what that means, we have here that green fluorescent cell which is expressing the CAV 3.2 channel. And then we can start by click in an animation and that's gonna sort of show us this is what happens in our mouse model, there's no more CAV 3.2. Um, so on the left-hand side of the graph, we have a wild-type mouse. When you give it CBD, it has this uh, increase in latency representing that analgesic effect, whereas in mice, which are these CAV 3.2 null mice, that analgesic effect was no longer significant. Uh, and really, that gives us an idea um, that CBD, when administered through the spinal cord, uh, produces this uh, analgesic effect through CAV 3.2 because when CAV 3.2 is gone, that analgesia is gone as well. Uh, so in conclusion, uh, what we showed in this paper um, on the next slide is uh, back to that uh, schematic. We've shown that CBD has no effect on CAV 2.2, but instead directly inhibits CAV 3.2. And uh, that CBD, when administered uh, through the spinal cord, produces analgesia, and it does so in a CAV 3.2 dependent manner. Um, so basically what we've identified is that CAV 3.2 is a new potential mechanism through which CBD could be producing analgesia. Of course, uh, with a couple caveats, there's many other different potential candidates, and this is only through the spinal cord. Um, so, uh, just on the last slide, I want to thank uh, my two supervisors, Dr. Gerald Zamponi, Dr. Tuan Trang, and everyone whose pictures here are who did all the work in the paper because there's a lot of other stuff that I couldn't include today. And yeah, I'm really excited for discussion because CBD is just a really interesting thing to study and it's really much in popular media right now. So, really excited for the discussion. Thank you, Erica. I love me some biochemistry first thing in the morning. That's great. <laughs> um, and we've got a, we've got a series of questions lining up on the right side of the screen. Um, Perfect. So let's let's jump right into them. Does the use of CBD cause psychosis or I guess psychoactive activity at the same frequency as other marijuana products? Is this not a concern with CBD? Uh, so I can only speak to acute. I don't know the clinical chronic data, but in terms of acute administration, CBD um, has no known psychoactive component. I can't speak to it if there's any chronic effects, though. Okay. Well, speaking of which, the next question addresses so an element of that. Is there a difference between acute and chronic pain and the effectiveness of CBD? Oh, okay. This is a really good question. Um, and this really gets down to the mechanisms of pain. And so acute pain is because you have activation of nociceptors in your skin due to an insult or an injury. Whereas chronic pain, there's ongoing processes that are happening um, depending on the type of chronic pain in the periphery, within the spinal cord and within the brain. And so there's chronic changes in the way that that circuitry actually functions. And so when it comes to our calcium, our favorite calcium channel, CAV 3.2, um, what the lab has previously found and other labs have found is that CAV 3.2 is a major regulator of uh, chronic pain and it's upregulated in chronic pain conditions. Uh, so in terms of if I had to guess, I would say that uh, CBD would be much more effective in a chronic pain condition, at least based on our mechanism. Uh, we didn't test it acutely with any acute model. 
uh, we tested inflammatory pain and we also did test a neuropathic chronic pain model within the paper. Okay, thank you. Another question from Chelsea Matthews. Have you tried other routes of administration in the CFA pain model? Uh, so I, for routes of administration for CBD, I'm guessing, and yeah. uh, no, we went uh, specifically with the intrathecal uh, because our question was really what's happening at the level of the spinal cord. Um, and so when you go with an IP administration, the, it then becomes peripheral central brain as well. Um, my guess is if you did that, there would be many other players uh, involved as well. Okay, time for a couple more questions. Uh, what are the effects of dosage on the analgesic effects of CBD? Also a very good question. So this, this is one of um, the difficulties when it comes to CBD is that no one seems to know the right dosage. Um, and you'll see papers with dosages as low as like 10 milligrams total. And then you'll see some papers in clinical populations where the dosage is like uh, 20 mg per kg. <laughs> Uh, which is a vast, vast difference. Um, what I can speak to is in our animal models, um, when we went to intrathecal dosages um, around like two micrograms, we didn't see an analgesic effect. We only saw that analgesic effect when we moved up to around 10 micrograms. And that was the lowest dose where we did see analgesia. So that's kind of suggesting you do need a larger dose. Okay. As the Last uh, last questions, and they're, they're good questions because you've got a very intelligent audience out here. Yeah, I'm loving these questions. Yes. Um, I read about a large study using cannabis and an equal group on a placebo that showed equal results. Is that because it was oral and not injected, or can you expand upon that study? Yeah, so this is... Um... There was a recent study, and um, it's not just cannabis, and it's, it's especially CBD where this is um, something that seems to be happening within the clinical population. When you do double-blinded placebo-controlled studies, in terms of the analgesia that is seen, it rarely seems to do better than the placebo control. There's a lot of potential reasons why. Um, I think dosage and route of administration are two big considerations. Um, and they're two big considerations, especially with our study, because we don't really know what 10 micrograms intrathecal means in terms of an actual person when it comes to the dosage. And um, with a person, usually when they're having uh, cannabis, it would be through an oral administration or potentially through inhalation, which means you're dealing with uh, metabolism, um, first pass effects, all these sorts of things. And CBD and THC love to be metabolized and break down into like hundreds of different other compounds, which have potentially different actions um, at these receptors as well. So it is, it is a very difficult question. And uh, that's probably why we're not seeing that translation into the clinical population as well as we were hoping when it comes to the animal studies. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Erica. Thank you so um, much. Yes, time to move on to session number two. I'd now like to introduce Dr. Chelsea Mattis from the University of Lethbridge. Dr. Mattis is currently working on a project that combines interests of immunology, neurobiology, and parasitology. Under the supervision of Dr. Erin Gruber, she is exploring the impact of toxoplasma gondii affection on the rodent host. And this protozoan parasite can infect a wide variety of warm-blooded animals, including birds, animals, and humans, whereupon it can form chronic infections as a cyst in the central nervous system of its host, which sounds like a very bad thing. So I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Mathis, and uh, the floor is yours. Good to see you this morning. Hello, thanks very much for having me here. Um, I'm just gonna start with a little bit of a, a shift. So when I first got my award um, to study that in my postdoc, I was pregnant. And so um, I did not study Toxoplasma gondii, Gandhi, have not yet. And I'm actually now more looking at how drugs like uh, cannabinoids and psilocybin might attenuate gut inflammation induced anxiety. So if you're interested in that, you know, I've just kind of updated that in my um, biography on my page. Anyway. So uh, yeah, let's get to it. You can bring up my, perfect. 
Okay, so again, thank you for inviting me here. I really appreciate it. And I've really learned a lot already about, um, you know, child mental health and, and these uh, CAV 3.2 receptors. So thank you very much to the previous speakers. Um, so we'll just go right into the next slide, please. So uh, we largely know how to deal with and manage acute pain, um, but chronic pain is a completely different beast that needs to be explored on a different level. And one in five Canadians live with chronic pain. It's a huge um, drain on, on not only quality of life, of course, but also the cost in the healthcare system. And this is only increasing with age. And so we know that this is a problem that's not going away. Next slide. And while evidence suggests that opioids um, might be have some benefit, overall, it seems like they could be doing more harm than good. And so next slide. Truly, we do need a, a new drug, um, one that won't make you sick as uh, well stated by Huey Lewis and his news. Um, next slide. So pain reduction is one of the most common reasons why people will use medical cannabis. And currently there's large knowledge gaps in terms of what the efficacy and the safety of cannabis might be for the management of chronic pain. Uh, further, we know that the psychoactive aspect of cannabis can be a barrier to some people. Um, the question here then is, is which, you know, and, and cannabis is made up of many, many different kinds of cannabinoids. And so the question is, which cannabinoids can have beneficial effects and how do they impact the perception of pain? So there are three main dimensions of pain perception. It's the transmission of pain, also inflammation and anxiety and depression. Next slide. So IBD is, is what I study. I um, am a gastrointestinal scientist, that's my background, and I'm you know, interested in, in inflammatory bowel diseases. And so these include things like Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, and they are essentially chronic and relapsing inflammation in the gut. And this is characterized by chronic pain, and it's highly comorbid with anxiety and depression. So it's important to note here that you know, the anxiety and depression is more than just the psychological burden of disease. People think, oh, of course, you're anxious and depressed. You have a disease that is affecting your quality of life and it makes you, you know, feel pain and potentially sometimes embarrassment. Um, so, of course, you're anxious and depressed. Uh, evidence suggests that, that is not the full story, um, that the chronic pain and the chronic inflammation that then is mirrored in the brain drives structural changes in the brain that then evoke and, and present themselves as mood disorders. Next slide. So I study animals, that's how I conduct my research, and we use an animal model of, of IBD to study inflammation and behavior. Uh, next. And it's my colleague at the University of Calgary that studies pain. And so first I'm gonna just show his um, data exploring how some non-psychoactive cannabinoids may influence pain in this animal model of IBD. So we selected uh, four non-psychoactive cannabinoids. We often call them just NPCBs. Um, so we looked at cannabic cannabichromine, CBC, cannabigerol, CBG, cannabidiverin, CBDV, and cannabidiol. Next. And we use a really common, well-established model for IBD, specifically this model's aspects of ulcerative colitis. And it's a nice model because it's highly reproducible. And all you need to do is kind of sprinkle this solution in the drinking water of mice. And it produces an inflammation that peaks about seven days after initially being on this, this um, chemical compound. Next. And so what Chris did was test a variety of different doses of these non-psychoactive cannabinoids, IP, 30 minutes before assessing the severity of visceral pain that these mice have as a consequence of gut inflammation. Next slide. Measuring pain in animals is, is a little challenging because they can't tell you if, if they hurt. But one of the most common ways that um, people use to assess visceral pain is by using this, it is through colorectal distension. And you can achieve this by inserting a balloon in anesthetized mice and gently increasing the pressure that the animal experiences which might be anywhere from like what you might feel um, 
at, at baseline, what, we, what you might feel like passing gas versus what you might feel like for bowel movement. And there are electrodes in, uh, placed in the oblique muscles and the reflective, con re re reflective uh, contraction of these muscles can then be measured. And the stronger contractions correlate to stronger experienced pain. Next slide. So as I said, um, we have, if you see on the x-axis, you have these different amounts of pressure applied in this balloon and the amount of pain um, experienced in the muscles. And you can see that in the mice that have um, DSS colitis, so DSS again is the agent we put in the drinking water. So I might just say DSS, but I mean animals with colitis. Uh, you can see that they experience the highest amount of pain and the administration of 10 milligrams per kilogram of CBD does seem to attenuate that severity of pain, which is great. Next slide. Um, we're all, we were also interested, or rather Chris was also interested in understanding how CBD affects the transmission of pain. So as Erica nicely illustrated before, you know, it's about um, nociceptors, the, these sensory fibers transmitting pain to the brain where it is then perceived. And these little um, red bright dots you see on the bottom panels indicate active neurons that are transmitting pain in the spinal cord to the brain. And you can see that mice that received DSS have many, many more red bright dots um, compared to the mice that received CBD5, five mg per kg of CBD, or 10 mg per kg of CBD. Um, when they uh, did a lot of accounting and the, and the um, quantitative analysis of that, they didn't find a significant difference, but it is trending towards reduced expression of neurons that are transmitting pain um, to the brain when they were given these uh, different doses of drugs. Next slide. I won't go through this too much in detail, but essentially the same experiments were uh, looked um, at these different cannabinoids, uh, CBG, CBDV, and CBC, and they did not find any evidence that pain was attenuated um, at various doses of these cannabinoids. Next study, or next slide. What was really interesting then is that Chris decided to do a little bit of a mixture. Some of the CBD5 makes per kg, and then he sprinkled on a few of the extra, uh, the additional uh, non-psychoactive cannabinoids that we had on hand. And if, as uh, this next click will show you, it was quite remarkable in terms of the ability for uh, abdominal pain to be suppressed. You can see that um, in the purple, that's the mixture. So these are mice that had chronic, or sorry, the, the uh, DSS induced inflammation in their gut. And when they're given the mixture, they have um, reduced uh, experience of pain. Um, and that is significant compared to um, just CBD five mgs per kg on its own. Click. Um, also, when they looked at the amount of neurons that are activated in uh, in the dorsal horn of the spinal cord, which then you know puts that signal up to the brain to experience pain, they found that the um, mixture um, was significantly able to attenuate that uh, the, the number of of neurons that were active in this in this sense. Next, and then so this is uh, essentially suggests that this mixture has sort of a, a synergistic effect and it is able to attenuate visceral pain and ascending pain more than just CBD alone. Next slide. So this is where I came in um, and I was doing these experiments sort of at the same time that Chris was doing his. So there's some slight differences in terms of study design, but um, you know, I was interested in understanding how these same drugs might attenuate inflammation in the gut. And so, next slide. Using the same model, what I did is I injected um, these four different cannabinoids um, at three different um, concentrations, three different doses, um, and I delivered it IP intraperitoneally at the time where the clinical signs of gut inflammation are just starting to emerge. And I gave this to the mice every day for five days. And there were a variety of different kind of parameters I used to assess. Um, inflammation, including um, body weight, the colon length, 
um, the colon length to weight ratio, and this macroscopic, macroscopic damage score, which looks at um, different components of the inflammation of the colon that I can see. Um, next slide. Uh, overall, many, many um, hours later, um, it was determined that there were no effects looking at this metric of gut inflammation. So these, these drugs did not seem to affect um, severity of the inflammation in the gut. Next slide. So then the next question was, well, what about the third sort of um, dimension that infl influences chronic pain? So anxiety and depression do seem to increase the perception of pain. Um, they increase the anticipation of pain, the worry that pain will be experienced in a way that won't, you won't be able to cope. And people with anxiety and depression do experience a greater perception of pain. And that's why it's important to kind of assess, well, are these drugs maybe influencing the ability of these mice to um, uh, experience these sort of behavioral changes? So in assessing anxiety and depression-like behaviors in mice, it's a bit of a challenge. Um, next slide. One of which is that anxiety and depression are not just sickness behaviors, they're different. And so we don't wanna just assess how, you know, how cannabinoids might attenuate sickness behaviors, lethargy, fatigue, that kind of thing. We wanna know, can these cannabinoids attenuate anxiety and depressive-like behaviors? So we wanna test these mice when there's no inflammation on board, because then we know it's not about sickness behaviors, it's actually about the anxiety and depression as a consequence of brain structural remodeling. So Christophe Altier, has done some studies before on this, and he found that actually, after you stop the DSS and and you wait five whole weeks, inflammation is completely gone because this um, model of colitis is a self-resolving inflammation. But at that five-week time point, they still experienced significant amounts of pain relative to controls, as you can see in this little graph here. So five weeks after treatment with the, this uh, DSS, the gut is still healthy again, like when they looked at different metrics of gut inflammation but they still have visceral pain. And so we wanted to apply this model and see, well, do they have any evidence of anxiety or depressive-like behaviors that could then be remediated by cannabinoids? Next slide. So this is what we did. We gave them the drinking water for five, the DSS in their drinking water for five days, and then followed that with five weeks on, on regular water. Next. And they were then given this uh, mixture of, of, of cannabidiol and the three other ones kind of sprinkled on and they were tested for anxiety and depressive like behaviors about 30 minutes later. Next slide. So testing as um, mice for anxiety and depression is a little challenging because again you can't just give them this hospital anxiety and depressive score. You have to find kind of ways that we might be able to assess you know changes in, in behavior that are similar to a depressive like phenotype. And so one of the things that we know with um, people with depression is there's reduced self-care. And, and so we can kind of model this in, this in mice using a spray task. Essentially, just spray them with a little bit of a glucose sugar solution. And you see how long it takes for them to start cleaning themselves. Next. And so these mice, um, either without colitis, um, no colitis, and the injection of the cannabinoids 30 minutes beforehand, mice with just DSS previously, like five weeks before, um, you can see that there is evidence that previous exposure to DSS does seem to increase the amount of time it takes for mice to clean themselves. Next. But you'll see um, it, there is a reduction towards um, um, latency to start cleaning themselves when they're given these drugs 30 minutes beforehand. So that was kind of cool. Next. Um, so this just to conclude, uh, Previous exposure to gut inflammation increases the time it takes the mice to start cleaning themselves. But pre-treatment with this, you know, 30 minutes before, the mice do seem to start um, changing that behavior. Next. Another key aspect of depression and anxiety is how you cope in stressful, inescapable situations. Uh, one of the ways we can test this in mice is using this forced swim task. So mice are very good swimmers, but they don't like to swim. And if you put them in a um, container of water um, where there's not an ability for them to kind of climb out, it's sort of a, it's a stressful situation for them. And they will respond in one of two ways, either a passive stress coping strategy, 
where they will just start to just kind of float and just do small movements to keep their head above water or an active stress coping strategy where they just swim more, even though that there's no sort of um, ability for them to escape the situation. Click. And what we did find is that mice with DSS exposure previously gear themselves toward a more active stress coping strategy. They, they're just swimming much, much more. And this is really incredible because this is five weeks after they've had um, gut inflammation, but they're still exhibiting this behavior. And we actually find this behavior consistently in our lab um, when disease is active as well. Um, next. But pretreatment with these cannabinoids did seem to restore sort of a more passive stress coping strategy, similar to that of controls. Next. So again, um, previous exposure to this DSS agent increases an active stress coping strategy, and that's remediated by pretreatment with this cocktail. Next. We also did a couple task tasks looking at memory. So this is this novel object recognition. And we found that um, mice that, so this is science, right? Some bizarre sort of results that we're still trying to process. Um, we found that um, mice that were given a, exposed to a, a novel object, normally they like to explore that novel object. But if they're given these, this cannabinoid mixture beforehand, they don't show any additional interest in this novel object. They don't seem to really care about it. Whereas the mice that previously had colitis, when they're given this drug, they do seem to, it kind of restores their ability to, um, to be engaged in that novel object, which is kind of interesting. Um, so I'm not quite sure why that is. Uh, next slide. So again, it's this previous exposure to colitis that seems to, um, that, that, you know, the pretreatment with with the drugs seems to kind of um, restore. Next. Uh, this marble bearing task, essentially mar uh, mice like to bury things, including marbles. And so it's one of the things that we look at to see how um, gut inflammation might impact like a normal ethological behavior. So uh, next. Essentially, we just monitor the mice and see how many mice marbles they bury over a period of time. And we found that, you know, previous exposure to DSS does not impact their ability to sort of an interest in burying things like marbles. But when they were given this drug mixture, they just significantly buried less marbles. Next. Um, so again, this is kind of similar in, uh, in terms of the previous study, we just find that you know, the treatment of, with this drug isn't kind of without potential drawbacks in terms of, you know, if you're a mouse, you want to bury fewer marbles or you are less interested in novel objects. Next. Um, and so finally, this open field task, it's a me measure of anxiety. Mice tend to um, stick to the outside edges of, of open fields. Um, and so the amount of time they spend in the middle, it sort of can be used as a metric of anxiety more anxious mice will really stay outside of that middle area. But it's balanced with the innate curiosity of mice. Next. And we can see, for example, that the treatment with these drugs did not affect their total distance moved or their velocity. And next. It also didn't affect their performance in this task. Um, so they, um, you know, in the mice that had DSS uh, five weeks before, they're not actually spending less time in the center. So it's not really, um, you know, there's nothing for the cannabinoids to attenuate at this point. Next. So again, um, the good news is that this drug mixture did not seem to impact uh, locomotion or anxiety. So the mice, for example, aren't not bearing marbles because they're less likely to move around. It's some other reason. Next. So to conclude first or next. <laughs> um, a cocktail may be the best avenue for treatment of inflammatory pain, but we didn't, but perhaps not inflammation itself. Um, so, you know, there are synergistic effects of these cannabinoids. Um, what we've managed to do is sort of take the fun bit out and then start kind of, <laughs> we deconstructed it and reconstructed it and found that that kind of was the best outcome in terms of, of pain. Um, as well, there's some evidence that this cocktail could attenuate some of the anxiety-like or depressive-like behaviors caused by chronic inflammation. 
although that needs to be sort of examined with some more sophisticated um, tasks. Um, as well, there's some evidence that these, this drug mixture can influence behavior um, on mice that don't have any inflammation, but for whatever reason, previous exposure to inflammation seems to kind of um, be a way to protect the mice against these effects of this mixture of, of cannabinoids. So my final slide, um, just a thank you to the collaborators. So this was funded by an Alberta M, a Cannabis, Alberta Innovates M Cannabis Grant. And we are working with some colleagues up at the University of Calgary, um, as well as my supervisor down here, um, Dr. Aaron Gruber, and lots of folks from our lab. So happy to take any questions. Thank you, Chelsea. I have so many questions, but I'm going to let the, there's questions, a whole bunch in the uh, column on the right. Let me go to a question from Eric here. Why do you think that having a mixture of cannabinoids on board is better than CBD alone? Is it the ability to hit more potential drug targets or a larger overall dose on the same drug targets? Well, I would suspect it's the former. It's it's um, likely a multitude of different sort of receptors being activated, and that can produce a synergistic effect. Um, but you know, we haven't done those sort of really specific mechanistic studies. But that's my guess. Okay, thank you. And one more question: uh, Are there concerns with an N NPCB cocktail? having a negative reaction with potential inflammation reduction drugs? Well, that's a good question. I am not sure about that. I mean, it depends a lot on the mechanism of action. And if we can understand how, you know, if we, if we know how these um, anti-inflammatory drugs operate, you know, understanding how the cannabinoids might influence uh, the receptors involved in those pathways uh, would be an important way to start. So again, the importance of mechanistic studies but so I, I couldn't answer that, but it's a, it's an important consideration. Okay, thank you. Yeah, there's there's a there's a there's a lot going on in those studies. So it's intriguing. Um, okay, well, thank you very much, Dr. Mattis. We'll uh, move to the final presentation in our session on psychedelics, cannabis, and the brain. And it is my privilege to introduce Dr. Pierre Chu. Dr. Chu is a professor in the Department of Psychiatry, Faculty of Medicine and Dentistry, and adjunct academic colleague in the Faculty of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Science at the University of Alberta. He's also a consulting psychiatrist, acute care and community addictions and mental health for Alberta Health Services, and a consulting psychiatrist with telemental health services for the province of Alberta. He's a full-time clinician and researcher and uh, was involved in the development of the assertive community, mental health crisis, and intensive community transition teams in Alberta. Dr. Chu, the floor Thank is you. yours. Thanks. Thank you to uh, Campus Alberta Neuroscience for um, uh, inviting me to uh, present at this symposium. I'm acutely aware that I'm the only thing uh, keeping everyone from lunch, and I have to follow two extraordinarily um, um, good uh, presenters. But um, I'm hoping to end this with a, a bit of a clinical flavor and uh, an overview of uh, um, psilocybin and um, um, uh, psilocin. Uh, if we can go to my first slide, please. Um, next slide, please. Um, my email address is on this slide. Please don't hesitate to get in touch with me if uh, we um, don't cover something that's of interest to you or, or you want a copy of the references. Next slide, please. Uh, just by virtue of quick disclosure, I do work for two companies who have uh, an interest in uh, psilocybin, um, Otsuka and Xylorian. Uh, so I thought it was important to uh, mention those. Next slide, please. So we're just going to cover uh, four um, particular areas during the course of the presentation. Um, a quick review of the nomenclature of psychedelics, um, um, some discussion of the pharmacology of psilocybin, uh, we're going to review some of the key studies that have been uh, published in the literature in the last 18 months or so, and then perhaps discuss uh, future studies and therapeutic directions. Next slide, please. Uh, so psychedelics is a term that was coined in 1957 and describes a subclass of the hallucinogens. Um, the true or the classic psychedelics um, typically invoke specific psychological, visual and auditory changes. Um, often in association with some alteration of uh, um, state of consciousness. 
Uh, from a, um, a pharmacology perspective, there are three main classes, um, tryptamines, phenylethylamines, or lysergamides. And most of these compounds have a principal mode of action, though not exclusive, uh, through 5-HT2A uh, receptor agonism. Next slide, please. So the classic psychedelics, as we just um, um, uh, mentioned on the last page, include um, LSD, mescaline, uh, DMT, and psilocybin. And I'm really going to focus on psilocybin today. Um, if we look at the rest of the nomenclature, and this is actually a, an evolving um, classification system, we have the empathogen or the intactogens, um, MDMA, MDA, GHB, uh, the dissociatives, ketamine, uh, PCP, DMX, um, which are principally NMDA antagonists. And then we have the atypical hallucinogens or psychoactives, uh, about which we've heard something al already today. Next slide, please. So uh, psilocybin, uh, chemical name on the slide there, which I won't uh, pronounce, um, is a tryptophan, uh, an indole-based alkaloid that uh, occurs in about 200 different species of mushrooms worldwide, sometimes up to about 2% by weight of that particular mushroom, depending on the species. Uh, first isolated um, in 1957 and uh, is structurally similar to serotonin, uh, which you can see on this particular slide. Uh, psilocybin is actually a prodrug, uh, so it's metabolized in the body via uh, dephosphorylation to psilo psilocin, uh, which is the um, active uh, compound. And we'll talk about that uh, more in the next couple of slides. Next slide, please. So um, if we look at, a, uh, at the receptor binding profiles of the um, uh, parent, if you like, the, the prodrug, psilocybin, and the um, active um, um, uh, compound psilocin, you can see that in terms of receptor profile, they're quite different. Uh, psilocybin actually has relatively little activity um, in terms of its uh, uh, receptor profile, um, some at 5-HT2B, which is interesting. And we'll talk about that more towards the end of the presentation. Psilocin has um, a significant activity also at 5-HT2B, uh, but a variety of um, uh, serotonin uh, subfamily receptors, as uh, you can see on this slide. And for those that may not know, I'm sure most of the audience does, um, obviously the, the lower the figure there, the, the greater the affinity for that particular receptor and the uh, increased likelihood of, of activity um, in terms of that particular receptor. If we can move to the next slide, please. So psilocybin is a, um, um, a remarkably um, low toxicity compound. A mean lethal dose um, in animals or rats uh, translates to a human dose of about six grams orally. That's not for the mushroom, that's for the psilocybin in of itself. Um, most of the toxicity reports in the literature actually relate to individuals consuming mushrooms that um, have other toxic compounds in them. Um, there are um, significant variations in terms of plasma levels and um, a, a significant inter-individual variation. Thus, it's difficult to predict uh, what a plasma level may be for a particular uh, dose of psilocybin that's, uh, that's ingested. There are um, um, physiological effects, psychological effects, and sympathomimetic effects. The sympathomimetic effects occur at uh, the uh, lower end of the dose range, um, and these are uh, reflected in a, from a physiological standpoint in terms of uh, uh, mydriasis, uh, changes in blood pressure and heart rate, which can actually be up or down, uh, tremor, dysmetria, and nausea. Although interestingly enough, in clinical trials, the most commonly reported side effect is one of headache. The psychological effects uh, occur with oral doses um, in the 8 to 25 milligram range, which generates plasma levels of psilocybin of about 4 to 6 milligrams per milliliter. Next slide, please. So if we move on to uh, psilocin, um, if um, psilocybin is ingested uh, within about 40 minutes, um, um, we can detect psilocin in the, uh, in the plasma. Um, it has a relatively um, short um, uh, pharmacokinetic uh, profile in terms of the time to Tmax and also the uh, um, half-life. So uh, it is a, a rapidly metabolized and uh, rapidly dissipated or excreted uh, compound. Interestingly, it has greater penetration than uh, the prodrug psilocybin, uh, which um, is suspected to be um, significantly responsible for its, um, for its action. It is metabolized uh, primarily through uh, monoamine oxidase, which is uh, an important enzyme in psychiatry. We'll talk about that more on the next slide, and eventually eliminated in the urine. 
So um, the effects of uh, psilocybin and essentially psilocin are increased with the concomitant use of any um, uh, compounds um, that will inhibit uh, MAO. Um, and so alcohol is one uh, through its metabolite acetaldehyde. Uh, smoking um, decreases MOA levels. And psilocin itself is a competitive inhibitor of uh, monoamine oxidase, which leads to increased brain serotonin levels. So you have a compound that um, uh, crosses the blood-brain barrier fairly easily um, and also then um, increases its own concentration within the brain. Next slide, please. So um, I'm going to start off a, a quick review of some of the important studies um, that have been published recently with this meta-analysis, which was actually an update of a previous meta-analysis um, about two years uh, prior. Um, and um, um, in this um, um, analysis, uh, they talk um, uh, at least initially about the uh, mode of action or the suspected mode of action of psilocybin. Um, we know that this is a compound that uh, increases intracellular signaling um, um, through uh, pyramid pyramidal cortical neurons, uh, which uh, then modulate downstream signaling prote uh, proteins, uh, typically ERG1 and ERG2. And we suspect that's the basis of the um, uh, increase in neuronal plasticity that um, is purported to occur with uh, um, psilocybin. There's also a, an effect on blood flow, um, and uh, psilocybin will um, um, invoke changes in terms of um, blood flow in the amygdala, which we know is important for emotional processing, um, within just one day of, um, of, of treatment. And that seems to be correlated with a decrease in depressive symptoms. This particular review, um, um, or meta-analysis, I should say, um, looked at uh, studies with uh, high heterogeneity, um, and I've done quite a number of reviews over the years, including for Cochrane, um, and um, it very much depends what data goes in, in terms of what data you can get out. Um, the studies um, that they analyzed um, essentially showed a, a rapid onset and persistence of effect with um, short exposure to uh, psilocybin, uh, low adverse effects um, in the treatment of major depressive disorder. So that seemed to be very promising. And there's been, um, as we all know, a, a great deal of, of um, hype in the media uh, about um, psilocybin. But I wanted to drill down on the on the slides, uh, in the next couple of slides, on some of the studies that they looked at. If we can go to the next slide, please. So uh, this is the uh, study by Guy Goodwin, a former colleague of mine from the UK. Um, and this has attracted a great deal of media attention. Um, because of uh, the um, uh, um, conclusion um, that a single dose of psilocybin was uh, an effective treatment for uh, major depression. And these are uh, patients who had a history of some resistance to treatment, i.e. previous um, antidepressant treatment. Um, so it was a phase two double-blind study, and there are relatively few um, control studies in this domain, but with a synthetic formulation of psilocybin. Um, so that in of itself, I think, introduces, I think, a, a question. Uh, three doses, 25 milligrams, 10 milligrams, and one milligram, the latter being used as a, a control. Importantly, and with almost all the studies we talk about today, um, this was combined with psychological support, although that is not clearly defined in terms of what that was. Um, in terms of results, 25 milligrams, but not 10 milligrams, reduced uh, depression scores significantly, um, and more than the one milligram control dose over a period of three weeks. The 25 milligram dose, however, was associated with more adverse events. And interestingly enough, when you look at the response rate at three weeks, um, it was around about 30%, 37%, which is actually numerically lower than most of the antidepressant studies for major depressive disorder, including for treatment-resistant major depression. So we have here a, a landmark study in the field, um, but limited by the ac a lack of a, a, an active comparator, lack of an ethnically diverse sample, um, exclusion of suicidality, and also the confound, which is part of all of these studies, which is subjective expectancy, the belief that you're taking something that's going to make you feel better, and also um, the fact that it's very difficult to blind the compound, so you typically know if you're taking it or not, and you generally know if you're taking a larger dose or not. Next slide, please. Um, so the next slide here um, uh, was, a uh, again, a single-dose uh, um, uh, psilocybin-assisted therapy treatment in major depressive disorder, uh, 14 days. Um, and here, uh, dosing was based on uh, body weight, although we don't actually have a great deal of evidence in terms of what, what plasma level, what 
brain level, if you will, were looking at for this uh, compound of uh, psilocybin and psilocin, they found a statistically significant reduction in um, Montgomery Asberg depression rating scale score, which is a scale that we use in uh, most clinical trials uh, with um, antidepressant uh, treatments. Um, and 54% uh, of those patients achieved remission, which is essentially the treatment goal in depression. Um, and there was also a reduction in terms of uh, suicidal ideation. So um, uh, only 8% of uh, psilocybin patients at um, endpoint had reported any suicidal ideation in contrast to 27% uh, a quarter of the patients who received um, uh, placebo. However, uh, again, the intensity of subjective experience was very high, and uh, four of the placebo patients also reported all of the subjective experiences that one would typically associate with exposure to a, a psychedelic. Now, this did not correlate with treatment response. And this study was, again, limited by the fact that um, there was a lack of an ethnically diverse sample. Um, there was that expectancy effect. Um, the quality of the therapeutic alliance and type and nature and degree of um, psychological support was not controlled for, and the investigators were non-blinded, uh, so they knew who was getting what. Um, and I think these are all important because I'm someone who designs and, and conducts clinical trials, and these are not clinical trials that would typically pass the or meet the threshold that we would be looking at in order to demonstrate um, efficacy of a compound in terms of uh, treating depression. Let's move on to the next slide. And then uh, this um, um, study um, attracted a lot of attention in the media because of the persistence of effect, because it was a 12-month follow-up study. Um, these were patients who were waitlist randomized, which is a curious kind of randomization to either getting treatment straight away or um, in eight weeks' time with two doses of psilocybin, again, with supportive psychotherapy, which is not well-defined. Um, 24 of the 27 patients uh, showed um, improvement um, in their Hamilton um, depression rating scale scores uh, with uh, almost 60% achieving remission at 12 months. So that looks pretty impressive. However, almost a third of those patients received an antidepressant during the follow-up period. So a standard pharmaceutical antidepressant during the course of the 12-month follow-up. And this study was, again, limited by the fact that it was small, um, 27 patients, um, um, not ethnic diverse, and suicidality patients were excluded, no comparator uh, group. Um, and again, um, as has been shown in quite a number of studies and the literature, the expectancy effect and the psychotherapy, the type of psychotherapy, um, plays an important role in terms of responding or not um, to treatment. Next slide, please. Um, now, uh, this is a, a kind of a, a study in a different um, track, and it comes back to the mode of action of psilocybin. And um, I think a, an interesting study um, because it looked at um, ketamine and psilocybin, ketamine also being a, a psychedelic, a dissociative psychedelic. Um, and both of these two compounds, ketamine and psilocybin, produced um, um, comparable acute elevations in CFOS expression um, in um, similar areas of the brain. However, there were also some differences in terms of drug preferential differences in other areas of the brain. So the conclusion of the, the, the authors um, for this particular study uh, was that um, these types of relationships and endogenous transcript distributions suggested that um, the final common pathway might be one through glutamatergic receptors rather than perhaps um, the receptor profiles that we've been focusing on up until now. Next slide, please. So this is a segue to some of the research that I'm doing, and I'm more um, um, a clinical researcher than a basic science researcher. And we're currently conducting a study which is a, a proof of concept study um, in treatment resistant depression, looking at the efficacy of um, intranasal ketamine, which is available um, on the market in, uh, in Canada. Um, and uh, this is combined with a specifically designed um, psychotherapy that's been manualized, um, so therefore fully rep reproducible, multimodal, individualized, which involves, um, I think, some key components of cognitive reprocessing, mindfulness, emotional regulation, and behavioral change. So here we are essentially trying to control for 
uh, the therapy um, side of things. And this is a proof of concept study with ketamine because um, at the time we designed the study, we did not have access to uh, psilocybin. The future study, uh, which uh, we intend to conduct if uh, we receive the, uh, the, the funding, is a placebo-controlled double-blind parallel group study um, comparing psilocybin um, uh, with um, almond therapy versus psilocybin alone versus almond therapy alone. So we're hoping here to see if the therapy is really the key thing that enhances the uh, response um, to treatment. The other area that's attracting a lot of interest is um, in the so-called designer drugs. And these are uh, principally psilocybin homologs or, or, or analogs, if you will, uh, mostly compounds that are dialkyl tryptamines. And these all possess, um, almost all possess psychedelic properties uh, that are mediated through activation of calcium mobilization through 5-HT2A. So mode of action that's very similar to um, uh, psilocin itself. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and I apologize for this slide. I actually cut it from a paper this morning. I didn't have time to redraw it myself. Um, but if you look on the bottom part of the slide, and, and again, I apologize, it's not very clear, um, you can see the uh, activity at um, three key receptors for uh, serotonin, uh, for um, um, psilocin, and then a, a number of, uh, of the uh, structural analogs or functional analogs. Um, and it's interesting that there are um, some um, variations in that particular profile. Why is that important? If we move to the next slide. Um, because there is a potentially a long-term concern, uh, which I don't know that many uh, researchers have uh, particularly focused on at this point. And that is if you... Um, um, play around with a 5-HT2B receptor. This has been linked to valvular heart disease combined or observed with the ergo alkaloids, uh, which is essentially what LSD was derived from, um, and the um, 5-HT2B agonists that are used or have been used in clinical practice, such as fenfluramine, dexfenfluramine, as well as the hallucinogen MDMA. Now, up until this point, obviously the use of psilocybin and um, derivatives has typically been, be, been very intermittent and also generally low dose. What we don't know at this point is what happens if you are exposed to a drug that does have activity at this particular receptor at higher dose and for longer term. And I think as we've all found to our cost uh, over the years, you can spend a lot of time and effort researching a, a compound and it's only when it comes to market that you find that there, and it's uh, utilized in a, a general population, that you find uh, some of these um, toxicity parameters uh, becoming important. If we can move to the next slide, please. So um, in medicine, we, we talk very much about the era of precision medicine, which is individualized care, it's evidence-driven, and it's measurement-based. And really, that's the, the fundamental tenet of, of good medicine. Um, it is how we treat patients effectively and safely. The problem is, I think, in this field, um, there is a, a paucity of data, and studies to date, as we've talked about, have some fairly significant limitations um, and you know, I continue to research in this area, but I really wanted to emphasize that, you know, this research into psilocybin and derivatives and other compounds for that matter needs to be evaluated with the same rigor as with all psychotropic drugs. And as someone who's designed clinical trials, and we talked about placebo response earlier, um, you know, one of the ways that we do that is we give everyone placebo and everyone who responds to placebo is then not allowed to continue in the study. So there are mechanisms that we could put in place to really um, ensure that that placebo effect and that actually placebo effect has been increasing dramatically over the last few years in all domains is controlled for. Um, but these make very expensive um, um, and very drawn, long drawn out studies. Um, and unless there, I think there is the I think commercial interest and uh, clinical support to do that, it becomes very difficult to uh, design and complete a, a, a well-controlled study that's going to provide the necessary information to treat patients effectively and safely. So I want to thank everyone for their attention, and I'm happy to take some questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Chu. There, there's a lot of information transferred there. Um, <laughs> yes, thank there's you. a lot of work going on. Um, I've got a couple of questions here on the on the on the question window, uh, but we should probably just we should probably bring everybody back into uh, into the conversation here. But here's a here's a first one from one of your co-presenters. If psilocybin antidepressant effects are not related to the psychedelic experience, 
what do you think the mechanism of action might be? <laughs> That's the million dollar question, I think. Um, uh, and everyone is, is, is certainly uh, chasing that. We know that 5 ht 2 a plays a role in, in terms of um, um, antidepressant effect. Um, the changes in blood flow that um, I touched on in that particular study, um, particularly with respect to the amygdala, also are important. Um, the um, 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 other changes in terms of transcriptional proteins, uh, again, I think um, 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 they're definitely contributory. Which one? I, I don't honestly know, and I don't think anyone anyone does at this point in time. Um, you know, this is this is relatively new research, um, uh, particularly in terms of the, the therapeutic direction that we're going in. Um, and uh, as we have seen from the presentation, it really is fraught with many many minefields in terms of, of things that confound and things that confuse um, the, 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 the clinical picture. And I think the direction that we need to go in in order to get that you know, clear um, um, evidence. Chelsea, you asked the question, do you want to expand upon that at all? Well, so this is something that's interesting us. Um, is my mic working okay? Um, we are looking at psilocybin now in our mouse model of chronic gut inflammation, which we have found creates a uh, fear generalization. So this is among what we believe to be the best metrics of anxiety in rodent models. So what we're doing is we're, um, you know, there's some evidence that uh, anxiety and depression is primarily as a consequence of changes in the prefrontal cortex um, and specifically a region called the anterior cingulate cortex. And there's some interesting studies that have come out like people that have more thin anterior cingulate cortex are more likely to have an emotional high um, in, in when, when given um, uh, psilocybin. Um, but we find that um, a thinning of this region is really um, predictive of severity of anxiety and uh, the presence of like sort of gut inflammation and related diseases. So the question again, like the, the how, the psychedelic experience might play a role, you know, that's with the 5-HT2A receptor, um, but there seems to be other receptors involved. Um, and then I just know that some of the one studies found that, uh, you know, changes in the prefrontal cortex in mice in terms of, of structural functional changes can happen, you know, after single injection and then you wait. Um, so you're basically looking after any psychedelic experience might be by the mouse might be, um, subsided. And so we're looking at how, you know, we're, we're giving the mice psilocybin and then 72 hours later testing them for anxiety um, because we suspect it's, you know, the psychedelic experience might be irrelevant, but we're not sure how, uh, obviously we think that it has to do with potentially um, mitochondrial function being kind of restored, but that's very much down the line. Yeah, and I think you really touch on a couple of very important points. Uh, so I think um, it's likely that the modulation of the receptors and pathways that we are still trying to understand is probably very tight. In other words, you can be below and you can be above, um, and that either has no effect or it generates perhaps psychedelic effects. Uh, but for each individual, there probably is a, um, a window um, of response that's very tightly defined for that particular individual. And we have no, no idea uh, what that is. The plasticity uh, phenomenon that you talked about, I think, is also key to um, um, uh, the mode of action of this class of, of compounds. And we know that exposure to stress in humans produces white matter changes that are uh, present um, throughout uh, childhood and adult life and certainly um, 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 precede uh, the development of uh, anxiety, depression, and other psychiatric disorders. So is there a role for um, a plasticity effect in terms of reversing or changing some of those white matter cortical PFC changes um, through the use of this particular agent? I think what's extraordinary to me is that that can happen or seems to happen in a very short window of time. We know that with treatment over a long period of time, we can sometimes effect change. But the fact that that plasticity effect occurs so quickly, um, to me, is, is quite an extraordinary um, 
uh, process. And I think that's, to me, the key to, I think, unlocking the benefit of these kinds of compounds. If it only takes one or two doses in order to start to affect that change, and then you can build on that with therapy or other medications. Um, in it's a sense, it's kind of unlocking the door or um, um, opening the, um, uh, the box in then being able to um, implement uh, additional therapies that have perhaps a bit more of a, um, um, an understandable um, uh, treatment direction. In the limited time we have available, there's, there's, there's one question here that I think cuts across all three of you. I'll just modify it. So the, the question asks about the major adverse effects of psilocybin or, or CBD versus traditional pharmaceutical interventions for treatment of MDD or for pain. Now, um, Erica, would you, do you, have, would you like to start? Um, so this is one of the places where CBD is actually pretty cool because in terms of major adverse effects, um, they're pretty limited actually. Um, you only really see adverse effects, uh, at least in a preclinical model, when you hit dosages, I think it was like five or 600 mg per kg. Uh, which is a really high dosage. Um, when it comes to lower dosages, uh, adverse effects seem to be quite minimal, um, which would be very beneficial, uh, especially when it comes to uh, the other main candidate for treatment of pain being opioids, which have a myriad of adverse effects. Uh, so there's a lot of benefit there and even more benefit when it comes to potentially adding CBD on um, as an adjuvant to opioids to lower the opioid dose, something like that. Hmm. Dr. Matthews, Dr. Chu. Uh, yes, I mean, I think uh, the hallmark of, of uh, the compounds we've talked about today is that they are uh, remarkably well tolerated, um, whether we're looking at uh, psilocybin or, uh, or, or CBD. Um, that being said, though, I, I think it's always important to, to, to bear in mind that a natural product doesn't is also going to have side effects. Anything that modulates a receptor is going to have a potentially beneficial effect, and at some dose for some individual, it's also going to generate some side effects. So there is nothing that has clinical benefit or clinical efficacy without some degree of um, adverse effect profile. How great um, that is or how significant that is for that individual uh, obviously varies um, from, from person to person. But I think it's important to quantify it in that respect. We have a lot of natural products that are actually very toxic. Lithium, for example, um, you know, the gold standard in the treatment of bipolar disorder. If you're out of that therapeutic window, you can die. Um, so, you know, we need to be very cautious in terms of, I think, understanding the full profile of um, these compounds in real world practice, because in real world, people are taking a whole bunch of other medications, they have other comorbidities, and all of that plays a role in terms of uh, potential benefit and potential side effect. I'll maybe just um, expand on on that, if I could, like the, the, L, the LD50, the amount of psilocybin you have to take for a lethal dose is something like 283 milligrams per kilogram. So very, very high. There is no evidence um, and I, I know this because I'm currently writing a protocol for to try and use the high dose of psilocybin on mice, but there's no evidence of people um, having really adverse effects with psilocybin in terms of, of severe health at outcomes. Um, that being said, I think it's important to recognize, you know, that anxiety and depression, it's very, very diverse ideologies. And I think that certain subpopulations would probably benefit a lot more from a certain treatment than others. Um, and I think that kind of understanding which populations is going to be a, a really tricky thing to navigate in the future. Okay, I think I think we're we're at the end of our time, um, so I think that's that's a that's a good way to end it. Uh, and I want want to again express appreciation on behalf of all the uh, the participants in the conference so far for the uh, intriguing. Uh, insights you brought to the to the table today. So thank you very much. The emojis are going crazy, erupting off the bottom of the screen. So that's a good sign. Uh, we are going to take a well, we'll we'll, we'll call it a, an eleven minute break. Um, it's it'll be a quick one, but we'll see you back here at one o'clock or just shortly thereafter. And again, thank you very much. Thanks again to the presenters. It's been uh, an extraordinary morning. Thank you.